You know, when I, was a, when I was a little boy, I loved watching Saturday morning cartoons. And no matter what cartoon it was that I was watching, there was always this uh, tension between the good guys and the bad guys, right? Uh, maybe some of these will remind you. <clears throat> Do you remember the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote back then? I mean, this poor coyote never got lunch. But Or uh, what about Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd? Right? Elmer Fudd was always the bad guy. Or Fred Flintstone and his neighbor Loud Rock. Uh, or, uh, or Snoopy. Uh, I love the epic dogfights between Snoopy and his arch enemy, the Red Baron. <clears throat> Those were the good old days. They don't make cartoons like that anymore, do they? Uh, as you've been studying Jonah, I'm certain that you've noticed there's some tension in this story. Uh, this this tension between Jonah and the Assyrians, these Ninevites. For some reason, Jonah hated these people, like with a passion. So when God taps him on the shoulder back in chapter 1 and says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to share my love with the Assyrian people by preaching a message of repentance, Jonah was like, nope, not doing that, and he goes in the complete opposite direction which is kind of ironic because Jonah's main job as a prophet was to represent God to the people. Now, most of the prophets in the Old Testament spoke to the Israelites. This is one occasion, one rare occasion, and the only other one was Nahum when he went to uh, Nineveh, but it was a different situation. So you could say that Jonah was the only prophet that actually went to speak to a people that were not... Uh, of Israel. And so his job was to represent God rightly to the people. Now, the question I have is, why would God send Jonah? He had another choice. He had Hosea. Hosea and Jonah were contemporary prophets. And if you know anything about Hosea by reading the book of Hosea, it's another real small book in the Old Testament. This guy was a lover. He was about as gracious and patient and long-suffering as a guy could possibly be. And to me, he seems like a very good choice to send an Nineveh to represent God's forgiveness and compassion to them. But God didn't send Hosea. He sends Jonah, which makes a thinking person ask the question, why? Well, the only reason that I can think of, maybe you have one, uh, that you can share with me later, is that Jonah actually needed to learn by experience that God loves everyone, even his enemies. And if Jonah was going to represent God rightly in this world, he would need to learn how to love his enemies too. And I think there's an important lesson for us in all of this as well. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 2.9 that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of his darkness into his wonderful light. Peter's reminding us that our testimony to a watching world is what God has done for us. And that that then becomes the means by which we share God's love and mercy to others. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 that we're actually Christ's ambassadors in this world. So we are to represent him rightly. Consider this. Maybe we are most like God when we love our enemies. To love your enemy takes something far more than you or I have to give on our own. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, can I, I don't really have any enemies. Because typically when we think of enemies, we're thinking of that person who's really out to get us. Maybe that person at work or that, <clears throat> you know, uh, bully in the, on the playground or whatever. But actually, the way that your brain is designed to work is that whenever anyone does anything to actually hurt your feelings, it creates a stress response in your brain that puts you into enemy mode. And that can be your spouse, it can be your, your children, it can be a colleague at work, it can be a coach, it can be anyone Anyone who does something to hurt you in any way, if you internalize that as hurt, it's going to put you into enemy mode. L let me just give you an example. Uh, not long ago, my wife Susan, who I've, we've been married now, um, uh, April 12th will be 38 years, and 
she probably I could count on one hand in our 38 years together when she has done something to hurt me. It's usually my job to hurt her, right? But on this rare occasion, she said something that really hurt my feelings. And so what did I do as a, a man who's walked with Jesus for 50 years, you know, a pastor for 30 years, what did I do in response to that? I marched up to my office and closed the door and pouted like my four-year-old grandson. I've got that one down pretty well. And so as I'm sitting there, kind of licking my wounds, uh, I get a text. I kid you, you can't make this stuff up. I get a text from a friend of mine, and this is what he said. Ken, I wanted to send a blessing to you as you lead your wife and daughters and grandchildren in Christ. I bless you, Ken, with the courage and strength to love on your family through the power of the Holy Spirit that brings forth patience and kindness gentleness, humility, and a surrendered heart to Christ with passion that surpasses all others. This is from a friend of mine. And do you know the first thing that I thought? What an idiot. <laughs> Stupid friend, you have no idea. I mean, how did he even know? So I'm not making this up. The timing of this was a little scary. So then I realized, oh, maybe God's trying to tell me something. And so then I went down and started the repair process. My point is this, maybe the enemy that you need to learn to love is sitting right next to you. So how do we do this? How do we become the kind of people who are able to love our enemy, whoever that person may be? Well, to start with, we need to see what that looks like. And I think that's what we have here in this section in Jonah 3, 1 through 10. God reveals through three expressions of love how to love our enemies. And he does it by his example. So let's take a look at these. Expression number one is that God's love is forgiving. We see this in verses one and two. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message that I give you. God is the God of the second chance, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. There is no limit to the number of times that God will forgive. How many of you have ever needed a second chance in your life, okay? How many of you needed one in the last 24 hours? How about on your way to church this morning? Yeah, that's what I thought. The truth is, we all need a do-over from time to time, and Jonah is no exception. He disobeys God's first command to go to Nineveh. So God disciplines him in the belly of a, of a great fish three days and three nights, during which Jonah cries out to the Lord for help. God hears his cry. God responds with grace and loving forgiveness because God, that's the kind of God we have. And it's God's desire to forgive the Ninevites. But what's interesting is that he starts with Jonah. God gives Jonah a fresh glimpse of his love by giving him a second chance. See, we can't give what we don't have. And so there's this dynamic going on in this story that God is doing for Jonah what he wants to do for all people. That God's grace is for Jonah just like it is for the Ninevites. That God's mercy, Jonah needs God's mercy as much as the Ninevites do. And maybe that's true for you. You know, 39 years ago, God gave me a second chance. He's given me others, but this was a big one. The woman that I was living with at that time had an abortion, and when I realized the horrible consequences of my actions and the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that ensued, I, I remember the day after like it was yesterday, and I was absolutely undone. And I remember I was walking down at Doheny, wondering how in the world I had gotten into this pit of sin and despair. And I just cried out to the Lord and asked for his forgiveness. I asked for his mercy and compassion. And I was as broken as a person can possibly be. And God let me down a rope for me. And God pulled me out of that pit. 
And then he turned me around and he set me on a trajectory that thankfully through the power of his spirit and a lot of loving relationships, I've never looked back. And so I stand here today as one who is a trophy of God's grace. And I know that's true for you too. Friends, there is nothing, however horrifying, that you have done that God will not forgive. And your sin is not the exception to his grace. If you cry out to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, he promises to forgive you. Look at 1 John 1, 9. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want you to know the order here. We confess, that's our part. We confess, and then what happens? God forgives. That's his part. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't deserve God's forgiveness. You know, over 30 years being a pastor, I've heard that one a lot. And the truth is, you're right. You don't. None of us do. But forgiveness, God's forgiveness is not based upon our, uh, it's not actually about us. It's really more about him. Because it's an expression of his character. Look again at what John says. He is patient, he, or he is faithful, and he is just, and he will forgive our sin. It doesn't have, say really anything to do with us. It's all about him. That's God's nature. It's his nature to forgive. And the one thing that helps me forgive others when they hurt me is to remember what God has done for me. The forgiveness that I have received from him then gives me the capacity to extend that forgiveness to others. And so my capacity to love my enemies, I think, is directly related to how I have actually internalized God's love and forgiveness of my sin. It creates an entirely different perspective and context. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, and then look at this, just as in Christ God forgave you. We forgive as we have been forgiven. So the first expression of God's love that shows us how to love our enemies is, is forgiveness. And the more willing that we are to accept and internalize God's forgiveness for us, the more capacity that we will have to extend that same forgiveness to others because you can't give what you don't have. Does that make sense? Expression number two, that God's love is patience. We see this in verses three and four. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now notice it doesn't say that he went to Nineveh with a great attitude, right? But he goes, so that's progress. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. And on the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, the word important there refers to the size of Nineveh, and Brandon talked about that a couple weeks ago. But as great as the city, uh, uh, or the city of Nineveh was in size, the sin of, their, of its people were, was even greater. Back in chapter 1, verse 2, God refers to the Ninevites, uh, the, the wickedness of the people of Nineveh. In fact, if you drop down to verse 8, the king of Nineveh even refers to his own people as evil and violent. So these people were not some, they weren't to trifle with. And if you know anything historically, that the Assyrians were probably one of the most barbaric people in, in battle. <clears throat> they would torture their victims. They showed them no mercy, including women and children. I mean, I can't even read to you historical accounts of it because it's so graphic. And they did that because it instilled fear in all the people that they governed so it would keep them in line. And so if you heard, if, if you decided not to pay tribute any longer, which is actually part of the story of Hezekiah, that's another great one, if you decided not to do that, then they're coming for you. And everybody else would hear about that. So you don't mess with them. That's the idea. It was a means of intimidation, but the barbarism was legendary. 
And yet, in spite of that, God is unbelievably patient with them. Listen, God is not quick to become angry or to destroy. The book of Nahum in the Old Testament is all about the future destruction of Nineveh. And Nahum was prophesying a hundred years. He was prophesying about Nineveh's destruction a hundred years before Jonah even shows up. And then Nineveh wasn't actually destroyed until 150 years later by the Medes and the Babylonians. My point is, is that from the beginning of Nahum's prophecy, a hundred years before Jonah, to Nineveh's destruction was 250 years. That's what I call patience. That's long suffering. God has a very, very long fuse when it comes to dealing with sin. Judgment is never his first response, but is always a last resort. So why is God so patient? Well, Paul gives us, I think, as good a reason in 1 Timothy 2, 4 as any. It's because God wants everyone to be saved. That's the heart of God. God doesn't want anyone to be condemned. God doesn't want anyone to be separated from him for eternity. That is not the heart of God. Now, we know that not everyone will be saved because not everyone will receive the gift of salvation that is being offered to them. And yet, the heart of God is that everyone would. God is as patient with those of us who do believe as he is with those who don't. And yet, even though Jonah had a recent experience with God's patience in his own life for his own sin, he was still resistant to sharing that message with the Ninevites. We see his reluctance in the words of his sermon. It's pretty clear. We have a whole thing right here. I mean, it just goes to show you, if you can't be good, be, be short, be brief. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And I read that and I think, really, Jonah? That's your message? That's the big takeaway you got when you encountered God's love and grace and forgiveness in the, in the belly of the fish? You know, that's all you took away from the storm? That's, that's, that's where you're going with this? I mean, this guy is about as stubborn as they come. Frankly, this is probably the worst sermon ever preached, right here. I mean, it was all burn without the turn, right? But sometimes right behavior precedes the right attitude. It reminds me of the story of, of a little boy who wanted uh, to stand up on the front seat of the, uh, while his father was driving. And after a few very patient, kind requests to uh, sit down, the father finally shouts out in exasperation, son, sit down and put your seatbelt on. And so the little boy reluctantly sits down, puts his seatbelt on, and he crosses his arms uh, over his chest, and he says, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> I have to admit, I've been guilty of that kind of an attitude at times, too. Maybe you as well. And yet, despite this terrible sermon, the Ninevites repent. Let me just look again at verses 5 to 9. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, that, uh, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was kind of like burlap, right? It's this really scratchy sack that you would actually carry grain and stuff around. And so to put that on would be very uncomfortable. It would just kind of be this, this means of contriteness and repentance. It was just a visible way of showing that. When the news uh, reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And when he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone urgently call urgently on God and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. He got, the king got all that after Jonah's really terrible sermon. Pretty remarkable. You got to admit, this is an extraordinary response, right? National repentance from an eight-word sermon? 
How does that happen? Well, some historians have suggested that uh, Nineveh had recently experienced two significant plagues that had killed a lot of people in their city. Uh, And also, from a historical standpoint, uh, they had experienced a fairly recent complete solar solar eclipse of the sun, like what we're getting ready to have uh, here pretty soon. And you can just imagine, if you don't know what's going on up there, how that would freak you out, right? And so it's very possible, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's very possible because I know that God has used circumstances in my life to tenderize my heart to bring me to a place of repentance. So maybe that happened. Regardless, when this crazy guy comes walking through town with torn clothes, bleached white skin, and smelling like fish bile, shouting at the top of his lungs, 40 more days and Nineveh Nineveh will be overturned, the people drop to their knees and repent. Clearly that is a work of God that they responded to. So here we have the first two glimpses of God's love here and how we love our, our, or how we love our enemies. And that is, we need to be willing to forgive as God has forgiven us. Secondly, we need to be patient with others. We need to be patient with those who have a hard heart. We need to be patient with those who are stubborn. You know, over the years, I've had many opportunities to talk with people about their resistance or reluctance to put their faith in Christ. And more often than not, what I've discovered is that it's less a lack of some kind of answer that they need, and it's, very, it's much more likely that there is some kind of hurt or distortion that they're dealing with that has just kind of put a hard heart against God. Because if God does that, I want nothing to do with him. And this might be your experience too, but if you're talking to somebody about the Lord, and they're coming back to you with uh, all these distortions, you can easily say, I don't believe in that God either. I believe in the God of the Bible who is loving and compassionate and kind. Yes, we are not minimizing that he is holy and just and righteous and will judge sin. But he has a long fuse. And we see that over and over and over again, especially throughout the Old Testament. And then finally, glimpse number three is that God's love, I'm sorry, uh, expression number three is God's love is compassionate. Look at verse 10. When God saw that they, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. God is the God of all compassion. If you want a character trait of who God is, that's a great place to start, that he is the God of compassion. You know, a lot of times we tend to want to start with that God is holy and righteous, that you're a sinner and you need a savior. And while that's true, don't forget that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance and leaves no regret. In Exodus 34, verses six to seven, God reveals himself to Moses. And look what he says. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yes, God judges sin, but he has a very long fuse. And that doesn't mean that we take advantage of that. You're wise if you don't. But he is patient, and so must we, if we are going to represent him rightly in this world. And throughout the Bible, we see numerous numerous examples of God's compassion, but I think the embodiment of that compassion is in none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus, as the exact representation of God, revealed God's compassion as he wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. It was out of compassion that Jesus became a human being and walked among us. It was compassion that moved Jesus to make the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute speak and the lame to walk. Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowds and they were sheep without a shepherd. It was out of compassion that he actually touched and healed a leper. And ultimately, it was out of compassion that Jesus went to the cross and died in our place 
taking our sin and the penalty for our sin upon himself at the cross. The Lord shows over and over and over again that he has compassion for all people everywhere. And if we are to represent him rightly in this world, we are to do so as well. There has never been or ever will be one exception to this because compassion is an aspect of God's character that will never change. But sadly, this doesn't seem to matter to Jonah at all. In fact, he prefers God's wrath to be poured out on the Assyrians instead of his love. And then Jonah gets angry with God. So now God's his enemy, right? As, as, as you'll probably see next time, because Jonah knew all about God's character. That's the exact reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. It's like Jonah is saying, God, I know that if I go there and I preach the sermon that you give me, you're going to forgive them, and I don't want them to be forgiven. I want them to all go burn in hell. That was his attitude. And you're thinking, wow, what a great attitude for a prophet of God. He knew that. And we don't know why he hated them so much. The Bible doesn't tell us. Because I don't think that's actually the point of the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is less about Jonah, and it's more about who God is. And all of us are like Jonah in that we need multiple chances in our lives, and God is gracious and willing to give those chances as if we come to him with the right heart. It's, it's just quite amazing. And then as we receive, then we give. As we receive, then we give. We, as followers of Christ, have been called to love our enemies as God has loved us. It's as simple as that. So now that we have a a glimpse of kind of what this looks like, let's talk for just a few minutes about how we do this. All right? How do we become the kind of people that love our enemies? And I say it that way on purpose because a lot of times we think that the Christian life is about trying harder to be like Jesus. Remember years ago they had the bracelet of what would Jesus do? I don't think that's very helpful because it's not about doing what Jesus did by willpower in the moment that it is needed. Instead, it's about becoming the kind of person that will just naturally love my enemies when the need arises. Do you see the difference? It's a change from the inside out. It's a change in my character. It's not about behavior modification. It's about heart change. Jesus is into heart change. The Christian life is simply about you and I becoming more and more like Jesus in his character through the work of the Spirit and our direct participation. That's it in a nutshell. I, I, I could make it a lot more complicated than that, but that's it. It is, it is simple. So how do we love our enemies? Well, Jesus gives us some very clear instruction in Matthew 5, verses 44 to 45 in what we are to do, what our part is in this. And look what he says. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So love your enemies and pray for them And that then will be a demonstration that you are his people. Pretty simple. So to love our enemies, this is a command. It's not a suggestion. The Greek tense here is it is an imperative. We are commanded to love. And again, I would go back to we are to love as he loves us, right? We love because he first loved us. We can't give what we don't have. And so as we are more and more internalizing and metabolizing God's love and forgiveness and grace and mercy in our own lives, then we have the capacity that shapes us and changes us so that we are now the kind of people to be loving to those who hurt us. Not because they deserve it. That's a really important dynamic. Forgiveness is not given because a person deserves it. They're given because it's an expression of the heart of God. And if we are to represent him rightly in this world, it's part of what we, he is shaping us to do. You know, it'd be interesting if, if a person was considering giving their life to Christ to suggest to them, don't give your life to Jesus unless you want to become the kind of person that loves your enemies, because that's where he's going with this. 
right? We always tie heaven into this. And while heaven is a great byproduct of our salvation, it's not the goal. The goal of our salvation is to become like Jesus. Heaven gets thrown in. And if heaven were all that there was, that would certainly be enough. But there is so much more. It's called the abundant life. And the abundant life is the result of becoming more and more like Jesus in his character. And that requires cultivating greater intimacy with Jesus because that's what actually shapes character. And all of that then leads to a different quality of life that Jesus characterized as, as abundant. To love our enemy is to desire God's best for them. It's to desire God's best for them. Love moves us toward establishing a relational connection and it promotes the desire to repair and reconcile. Sometimes we can't do that, but God wants us to move in that direction. Sometimes the person that you need to forgive, that you need to love, <clears throat> is not here anymore. Maybe they're dead. Maybe they moved. Maybe it's not the kind of relationship that you are able to contact them and talk with, through with them. You, you can forgive another person and love that other person without actually that other person being there. Love makes the relationship more important than the problem. Love makes the relationship more important than the problem. The second instruction that Jesus gives us is to pray for them. Again, the, the tense here is a, it's a command, not a suggestion. So both love and prayer are also in the present tense, meaning that they are ongoing, continual actions, that it's not something that we just do once, that it's something that is going over and over and over again. This was Jesus' whole conversation with Peter when Peter comes up to him and says, Lord, should I forgive somebody seven times? Because, wow, that's really spiritual. And then Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And then he's doing the math. Okay, so 490 times. He's like, Peter, you are just missing the point here, son. It is a continual, ongoing process just as we are being forgiven by him. To love and pray for our enemies is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing, continual process. Why? Because love and prayer move us toward unity. And unity is a big deal to God. It's a big deal. You know, we are fast coming upon uh, our national elections. And I have never seen more animosity and vitriol and hatred for somebody holding a different perspective than another than I have than I do today. And I'm sure you guys see it as well in the news. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Listen, as brothers and sisters in Christ, our job is to be unified. Doesn't mean we have to agree with each other. I, I had this conversation with my father yesterday. And so, yes, people are gonna have a different opinion than you. Duh. It doesn't mean you're right and they're wrong or they're right and you're wrong. It's a different opinion. And everybody has enough evidence on their side to prove that they're right and that you're wrong. And what does that do to our relationship? It just fragments them. And then the enemy is standing back just going, this is awesome. I don't need to do anything. I can just eat popcorn and watch. I mean, it's just very entertaining for him. We have to fight for unity. Because it is not something that comes naturally to us as human beings. We naturally want to polarize. We naturally want to be right and the other people be wrong. And I'm just saying that's dangerous. And I'm not getting all political on you because that's not my point. My point is unity. It's a big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that the last prayer Jesus prayed before he went to the cross was about us being one. It's a big deal. In John 17, verses 20 to 23, Jesus prays that we would be one just like he and the Father are one. So the example is the unity within the triune God. That's the example, and that's what Jesus wants for us. That's the kind of, can you imagine if believers actually got along together like brothers and sisters in Christ and being gracious with one another when they have differences of opinions about any number of things that they can still love each other and be together and be in relationship, 
Can you imagine how, what a testimony that would be? Friends, it's not about right and wrong, as important as that is. And we see this in God's patience and desire to forgive and love the Ninevites. That's what we are called to do. God's the judge, not us. Years ago, I was in a situation at a retreat where um, there were some people present there that were very different than some of the other people that were present there, and it was concerning to me. And I, sadly, I kind of joined the people that were not really excited about this other group of people that were there. And as the week progressed, I just watched God do something in this group that then, of course, influenced my own heart. And I realized at the end of that retreat, it was a week-long experience, I realized at the end of that, God just reminded me, Ken, it's my kindness that leads people to repentance. It's my kindness. That doesn't justify sin. That's not getting soft on sin, but it's about reflecting the very nature and character of God. So how do we do this in a very practical way? Well, I wanna just give you an exercise to consider. In fact, let's just start with that right now. I just want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just take a second and think about a person right now that you're at odds with. Maybe they've hurt you, they've treated you unfairly. You have legitimate means to be angry and and feel hurt. I actually want you to Just think of their name. Give them a name, not a faceless person. It could be a could be your current spouse, it could be a former spouse, it could be a neighbor, colleague, former boss, employer. And if no one comes to mind, ask the Lord to bring someone to mind. So if, you, if you've been able to do that, I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm sorry that you've been hurt. I've been hurt as well. Hurt is just part of what we are going to experience in this life. And quite frankly, I've done my fair share of hurting others too. But if we don't let go of that anger, anger is a legitimate emotion, but if we don't let go of it, if we hold on to it over time, it starts to get infected and turn into resentment and bitterness and ultimately revenge, where we take matters into our own hands to exact justice, and I'm just telling you, friends, that is a dark road that will just suck the life out of you and does not lead to the kind of life that Jesus has made available. It is a path to our own destruction. And very often the reason that we get stuck in the anger stage is because anger is an empowering emotion where feeling hurt is a vulnerable emotion. And we were hurt because we were vulnerable, so it's like we're not going there. In order for us to receive God's forgiveness, we have to let the shield down and be vulnerable to internalize that, and then we will have the capacity to give what we don't have. So I'd like to lead you in a very quick and simple prayer to get this process started. This isn't gonna fix anything, but this is gonna get you started in that direction, okay? So let me just lead you in this prayer. Lord, I pray for, I just want you to say their name in in your own mind. They hurt me and I'm feeling so angry, but I wanna let go of that anger. I wanna be like you and love those who have hurt me. And so I'm taking the first step today on loving them. I pray that you will bless them with your presence and bring good into their life and to help them sense your presence and to experience your love. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the first step probably the hardest one, but the first one. And I wanna encourage you over the next 14 days, because repetition is what is needed here. Over the next 14 days, 
I want you to find a trusted friend that you can actually share this experience with. I want you to be able to share with that friend, this is what, what happened, this is how that person hurt me, this is what it, ha- what it is caused in my life. You don't have to go into all the details, but I just want, what, what you're doing when you do that is you're taking responsibility for your own emotions in that regard, and that's important. Secondly, pray for that person over the next 14 days as the Lord brings them to mind. Ask the Lord to be with them, to be, to, to be good to them, to show his presence to them. And then next, by next Sunday, if possible, I, didn't, I would like you to text them very simply and tell them that you've been praying for them to experience God's love and presence. If you do this for these next 14 days, I guarantee you something's gonna change. Most likely, what will change is you. And you will be able to let go to a degree, sometimes it's progressive, but to a degree of the pain that you've been holding on to. It's your choice to do, but that's the invitation. And as we do the, this, as we practice something as simple as this is, friends, this is a means for us and for the Holy Spirit to start shaping our character more and more to becoming like Jesus and representing him rightly in this world. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for just how both Jonah's example gives us such a clear picture, and there's many others that we could go to in Scripture for sure, but this is certainly one of them. And Lord, how how, how quite frankly simple the process is, but how unbelievably difficult It is for us to move through the intense emotions of hurt and anger. And yet, Lord, that's what's needed to bring unity. That's what's needed to bring healing and restoration. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us become the kind of people who love our enemies, that we, in doing that, will represent you more rightly in this world and that it will bring greater unity to the body of Christ than ever before. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.